for life. This is the second uh, demonstration on digital photography. The first one was introduction. This one is intermediate. And all I got to do is keep all these cords from getting wrapped up, which is not an easy task. Uh, in the first one, we talked about camera features and their meanings. We talked a little bit about camera comparisons, and we showed you some shots of uh, what different cameras will do. Even though the specifications say cameras are great, uh, they're not. We talked about batteries. We talked about taking some better pictures. How to adjust and correct images. That's overall adjusting and correcting for color, saturation, contrast, brightness, and hue. Uh, we did a little bit on taking better pictures, and then we did... Uh, something on printing pictures. The CD, if you pick that up tonight, will be a little bit different than the one that I presented. It has a little bit more information on it as I finished it up. The one that we're going to do tonight is not completed yet, and we, I will get that finished and have it available next week. We're going to do intermediate digital photography. We're going to start talking about an area called uh, taking photographs under difficult or different situations. We're going to cover night photography, small objects, and uh, I've got a, another photo guide out there we're going to show you. We're going to talk a little bit about editing pictures to make them better. And then we're going to go into a couple of detailed tutorials. Uh, one using SmartDraw, which is a very simple, uh, inexpensive program. It's about 50 bucks. And uh, then we're going to talk about and show the one uh, using PaintShop Pro. And uh, we're going to talk about doing some editing with Photoshop and what it involves. Uh, I have some uh, pre-run uh, demos we can do on that. And uh, I'll come back after we go through the program discussion and show you uh, what we've done with some of the badge photos that everybody thinks are just so terrific. And uh, last but not least, there's a number of programs that are on the, uh, the disc. Okay, we're ready to go. First part's taking better pictures. Uh, I'll probably stick a little closer to what you're seeing on the screen tonight than I normally do, but I will digress in several areas. Don't worry about it. Uh, the first part is taking better pictures. This is, this is more about how to use your camera and how to use it under different circumstances and what they mean. In the first presentation, I gave you two manuals. Uh, they're both Navy Tech manuals. One was a beginner's manual and one was an advanced manual. If you did not read those manuals, by all means, read this one. There's some things in here about how cameras work, how lenses work, and what light is. And if you understand a lot of that, a lot of the problems that you're experiencing taking pictures just kind of go away because you understand light balance, you understand where to stand not, not, and what not to do with your camera. The information that we're going to cover here shortly all came from a place called www.shortcourses.com. They uh, offer courses on uh, various and sundry things, and there is a list of what they've got. We pulled the one down off of their uh, for digital photography that we're going to go through. But if you're looking for more information about digital photography or specific guides on cameras, go out and visit that site. Okay. Uh, basically, it's a nine-step program to go through, and we're not going to cover every single one of these things. The important thing to do is that you really need to read your manual that came with your camera. It's the best tool that exists for taking photos. You have to know what that camera can do, and you have to figure out what that camera cannot do. And you only do that by reading the manual and trying the things. And after you've tried them several times, go back and read the manual again, because you will find that now it has a new meaning to you. Photo manuals for cameras are actually worse than manuals for computers and software programs. That's hard to believe, but with four cameras, I found that to be quite true. Then there's a section in dealing with looking at fine-tuning the picture for sharpness, working on it from an exposure standpoint, working and capturing light and color. This is a very important one to understand. One about using your flash. Talks about the different types of flash, how automatic flashes work, about taking portraits with flash and using it as a fill flash so that you don't get harsh shadows. What happens with different pictures? The, one of the things I want to point out here, if your camera is a, a high-end consumer camera, it probably has a hot shoe on it. That means it can take an external flash attachment that can put, put on it like you find in an SLR or a mid-format camera. If you do that, you cannot go take one off of a normal camera and use it on most digital cameras. Digital cameras have a nice, quote, a nice feature called white balance on the better ones. And what that means is it takes two pictures every time it takes one. 
When it takes a flash picture, it also flashes the flash twice. No, you can't see it. Your eye is not fast enough to capture a one ten thousandth of a second flash duration. But it actually takes two pictures. The first one is a white flash to get the white balance, and the second one is your actual picture. The problem is, if you use a conventional slave for an SLR or a commercial slave unit, it will fire with the first flash, and you won't, it won't fire with the second flash. So you have to make sure that your slave flashes or supplemental flashes are Digicam approved. Again, it talks a little bit more about positioning your flash, and that's very important. We covered that the last time. You don't want the red eye effect. You get the red eye effect because the flash is in line with the lens, in line with the people's retina, and you're actually seeing the reflection off the retina in the back of their eye. If your camera is off to one side or the flash is off to a side or you're using a detached flash or you can bounce that flash, the red eye will go away. These do have navigation links on the bottom, not a whole lot, but you can get back to the index and to the, uh, to the next one. The other one, uh, two I, I want to explore, uh, we can skip over this one for right now about close-up photography. We're going to do a whole section on close-up photography and macro photography. It's one of my favorite subjects. The thing I want to cover here and show you is this part here. This is the hardest part of taking pictures, <clears throat> and that's called seeing the picture, being creative. You can teach almost anybody which buttons to push under which circumstances. The problem is when to use which buttons to take that picture, what is the proper exposure control for what you're trying to do. You can get an exposure situation where it'll be correct, but there's a whole range of those things because the shutter speed and the f-stop is what determines that exposure. If you have a very fast moving object and you want to freeze it, you want a very fast shutter speed and a very which is going to force you to have a wide open aperture to take that picture. You have to know those things. The penalty of using that combination is now your background is going to be blurry because the depth of field on a wide open lens is substantially less than it is on a lens which is stopped down. So now you have, your focus has to be right on. The same thing goes if you're taking a picture that you want the foreground to be in focus and the background to be out. Even if it's not moving, you do the same thing. You kick up the exposure speed, you open up the lens, and it'll blur out the background. If you want everything to be in focus, you stop that lens down at if you have those controls or you can fool your digital camera and you oh, and then you slow down the shutter speed it all balances out it all works together all three of those things depth of field is related to the the f-stop of the lens the exposure is related to the f-stop and the shutter speed and you need to know that relationship because it determines what you're doing I have some other pictures I'm going to put in here and show you uh, that deal with that subject in dealing with panning your camera the proper way to pan to take a motion picture if your camera it doesn't have a variable shutter speed or if you don't have any control over it, there's things you can do with your camera movement to follow your subject to take your picture. If you just hold it still and click it as it goes by, your, the background will be in focus and this, the object that you're trying to take a picture of will be a blur. If you pan with the, the moving target that you want and press the shutter, then the subject will be in focus and the background will be blurred if you pan correctly. If you plan, pan in a straight line like this, it won't work. you got to pan on an angular motion, and then it will work. They're talking about things you can do here to improve your composition in terms of where you put the horizon in a picture, what's most important. That is a better photograph than that one. They have cut down the amount of horizon and have emphasized what is the main part of the subject. Taking uh, the night pictures and the... Uh, Pictures at dark or of the sky and of the, uh, the moon are very detailed. We have a whole section dealing with that that we'll come back to and, and cover in more detail. Reflection pictures. Again, to get these things to come out right, you, you need to have a camera which has some type of controls. And even a basic point-and-shoot camera, the better ones, have some way of fooling or locking exposure or locking shutter. So again, that's why you need to read that manual. But... This is deal that, you know, what is the picture? What makes this picture is the grass mode lines. What makes this one is just the pattern. Can you see that when you're out taking your picture? And just don't shot, shoot one time. We talked about this the last time. The way you get a good picture is you take lots of pictures. Nothing improves it by take your picture taking than experience. Change what you're doing when you take it. Just don't stand in the same place each time and just don't use the same settings each time. 
take it with different variables and see what those effects are. Remember, the cost of using a digital camera on a cost per shot is awful close to zero. It's not like when you're using a film camera. Again, the composition of the lines in a central point and path here is what's important. The emphasis here is on the movement in the background. Again, they held this shot, they slowed down that, opened the lens and showed, oh, tightened the lens down and opened up the exposure so you get the movement over here. Again, lots of shots, what's the pictures? That's the hard part of taking good pictures is seeing the picture to take it. Okay, I'm not going to go into that in detail. That's some homework that you can do. Night photography. Here we have a five-page guide. I'm not going to go through this in detail with you on how to take night pictures. What I want to tell you about taking night pictures is with any camera, you need to have a very good tripod. The better the tripod is, the better the pictures are going to turn out. When you buy a digital camera or even a 35 millimeter SLR, they love to sell you those nice little fold-up tripods with the, with the chrome legs on them. I meant to bring one of them tonight. I don't know what you use them for, but they're not any good for a camera. Is it yes. A webcam? Yeah, that's that's the point because that's where mine is. It's on the webcam. It, uh, it's it's just not sturdy enough to hold anything else or to lock it down tight and to keep it there. And if you're taking a night picture or any photograph that requires a long exposure, you have to be stable. And that takes a good tripod. That tripod back there that he's using is kind of, quote, okay. okay. In case you're wondering, this is $19 at Walmart. Yeah, buy the $29 one. It's a little bit better than that. You want one with positive locks. You want one with pan adjustment. You want one that's stable. It'll stay there and it'll hold weight. I come from the area where we shot 4x5 graphic cameras and 4x5 view cameras. And we hauled around tripods that weighed 60 pounds. And we set them in the ground and we staked them into the ground. They had points on them like a surveyor's transit does. To hold them in place, they had chains to hold the legs from sliding apart. And they were stable. Now you don't need that with today's cameras. But if you're going to take a picture that requires a long exposure, and uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Another one that uh, might be good for a webcam, okay? But that's about all. So you need a tripod, a good tripod. The next thing you need is some way to release that picture without touching that camera. If you touch that shutter, no matter how careful you are and how light you touch is, you're going to jiggle that thing. And if there's a bright source of light in a night photo, and there generally is, a moon or a star or a light in the distance, it's going to wiggle and it's going to be blurry. You can't do that. You need to have a cable release. Most Digicabs don't have one on the consumer end, but there are ways of getting around that. Here's a set of instructions on how to build one, and there are many ways to build one. Velcro straps is another thing that you can use instead of this putty that they have used here to go around and lock that camera. You can also build a little metal bracket that fits into the, into the underneath the tripod base and comes up around the camera and is tapped to take the cable release so you can press it down in there. You need to have some way of releasing it which is stable. If everything else fails and you can't do that, most all cameras come with a built-in self-timer. So, again, read your manual, find out how that works, and that's a way around that thing. You can set the self-timer off, you can get your hands off it, it's had a chance to stabilize by then, and it will take the night shot for you. Okay, that's what I want to say about night photography. The other thing I want to start on now is taking pictures of small objects. And this is one that probably when you first think about it, why would I ever want to do that? Well, if any of you have collections, coin collections, stamp collections, figurine collections, and Lord knows what else that's relatively small, 8 by 10, 10 by 12 in size, you might want to get interested in this, if for no other reason than to have a photographic record that you can put onto a CD, put into your bank safety deposit box, so if you ever have a burglary fire, earthquake, typhoon, or whatever hits this area, you have some proof that you have these things. Because having been a victim of a burglary, let me tell you, you get robbed twice. Once by the thief and once by your insurance company. So if you can't prove you got it, you got an uphill battle. And the other condition probably you get into right away is, what's the condition of what you have? Close-up pictures of something from two or three sides, or if it's a coin, both sides of that, where you can take and blow that picture up of that coin the size of the screen, kind of removes all those arguments. And your cost of doing that is very little to set up the staging equipment which is necessary to do that. 
Also, this area can be used uh, for building catalogs, taking pictures and setting them out on eBay, uh, stuff for your local newspaper or catalogs, or for trading with your, your friends. It says, hey, this is what I got. You know, Are you interested in this? Uh, personally, I use a lot of it for taking pictures of flowers, close-ups of flowers, which is one of my favorite things. Okay, let's look at small objects. This one is a commercial product, again, from the short course area. They actually have a lighted tent arrangement, which they use. You probably are not going to want to go out and buy one of these things, but if you look at this thing real quickly, all you really need is a bunch of one by twos and some very cheap white cloth. Don't buy the good stuff. You want the thin stuff. Because why? You're going to take and set your lights around the outside of it and use these as a scrim or screen to let soft filtered light through. If you look at this lens, when the light's coming through from three sides, there are no shadows on anything. That's what you're trying to eliminate. They're using Victor lamps. You probably aren't going to have a set of these at 60 or $70 a piece, another $20, $30 a piece of the stands. But the plain old clamp-on lamps from the hardware store work just dandy. You clamp them to anything you want. Buy the ones which have a little bit longer uh, reach to them and look at getting these compact fluorescent bulbs. Why then? Two reasons. One, they're daylight balanced, so the colors are going to be true. Point number two, they run cool, so that when you want to put something across that lamp, you can take an old piece of t-shirt that's washed out real nice and thin, the kind that your wife likes to take, the steel to make dust, dust claws out of, Take one of those, cut it up to it's a single sheet. You can clamp that around the rim of a light with clothespins. As long as you're using one of these nice, cool fluorescent lights. Don't stick a number one photo flood in there, because I don't want to hear about the fire. Okay? So there's there's a cheap way, you know, to get that done. Here's another uh, one, again, from the same thing. They're talking about using desk lamps that you can use. Uh, watch the halogen ones. They tend to put out a spot pretty pretty much. Different colors of poster board to give you different backgrounds, whatever you want. They talk about going out and buying uh, picture frame stretchers that the artist would use to stretch their canvas with. You could do that, but I would recommend either, again, back to my favorite, one by twos or uh, crochet frames work, quilt frames work, the lap type frames. They're, they come in different sizes. Some of them are, are round about that size. Some of them are oblong. They work quite nice. Personally, I like, I like a one by two frame put together. You can put them on with staples. You can put them on with thumbtacks. You can make them so you can take them apart. Make them fairly big, two, three by three feet, because when you go to set them up, then they can actually stand on the table. You can put your lights behind them. You don't have to figure out how to attach them. He's showing you how he's clamped his lights down on here. Just anything to use to get a bow into that background frame. And he set his pictures up. He's using his lights as spots and as you can see he's getting a spot effect with this the light to the side here coming through the screen doesn't provide any shadow it just provides illumination he's backlit with this one behind it so he's casting the shadow off to the front but he's got the detail on these photos that you need if this was a, a figurine collection or some thumbels or something hummels or something like that that you're trying to document it's a very good way to take pictures of them doll collection Coins are another little different story. We can talk about them in a second. One of my favorite tools, mine broke, is a ring stroke. These are still made. They're special ones for digicams again. Can't use a regular one. This is a. These units have a Series 6 or Series 7 filter on them. They actually screw onto the lens of the camera. And you shoot your pictures right through the darn things. This is an old AC unit. You don't want to mess around with one of these things to try to work out. This baby's got a 350 microfarad condenser in there. You put a screwdriver across it, it'll chew a quarter-inch screwdriver off just like nothing. These are very high-voltage units. But they do make a new version of these things, which is transistorized, and it'll work with the digicams. It's synchronized for the double flash problem and everything else. Can't afford that? Try the alternative. Remember those circle line fluorescent lights? Get an old unit, take it apart shoot through the tubes. They even make a unit that plugs into a, uh, screws into the top of a standard light socket, take the whole thing apart, throw all their crap away, screw it in, bend it over to the side, and stick your camera down through the center of it. It doesn't work well with mine because my camera has an extremely wide angle lens, so I, I get parts of it, I get a little bit of flat, a little flare uh, through the sides. But if your camera uh, has a zoom effect or has a 
more of a standard lens on it. It will shoot through there just fine. No shadows whatsoever. Great way for working with coins and stamps. And no heat. Would you use lens shade? Yeah, you could if your camera will support that and not photograph it. Yeah. It depends, it depends on your camera and what it does. Mine has an equivalent of a, thir a 35 an equivalent of a 31 millimeter lens on a 35 millimeter camera. So it's an extremely wide angle lens. But if you have a, a normal lens on a digit camera, it'd be about 40 millimeters, 45 millimeters, you, you should have no problems. And a lens shade, it, those will take a lens shade. Or you can take and build a little piece of cardboard around it, anything to keep the light from coming directly at it. Uh, they're about eight bucks at the take your pick, Lowe's, Home Depot, don't matter. Okay. Let's talk about making better pictures. Last time we talked a lot about taking better pictures. It's a lot easier to take better pictures than it is to make better pictures. Okay? One of the things I want to talk to you about here, if you're serious about editing your photos in digital photography, you need to have the right tool. And everybody has one of these, and let me tell you, that ain't the right tool. The cord is in the way, that's the least of the problems, but those roller balls are a real pain. You need to be very, very precise when you're working with these programs. I'm going to show you're working with eyeglass frames and strands of hair. And you can't get that thing to roll the right way when you want it to, no matter what you do. And you can take it apart and clean it and do whatever you want. But it, it's kind of like trying to do surgery with a meat axe or a butcher knife. Next best thing is an optical mouse. That's what I'm using here. There's nothing rolling in this. And it'll work on any surface. You don't have to worry about rolling off the end of the mouse pad. It has a wire problem. And uh, we'll show you some ways when, we, when you give you the real, the real disc of dealing with this wire problem in terms of how to hold it up and some, some mouse tail holders and so on and so forth. Obviously, the wireless optical mics are the way to go. Uh, a wireless mouse, about 50 bucks, I imagine. Uh, $25. They're on sale at CompUSA. Oh, there you Thanksgiving, go. So. Um, the optical mice were relatively expensive when they came out. Down at the last show, the gateway version of them were selling two for 15 bucks. So, you know, this is not going to break your budget. If you want to get very serious about it, you're semi-pro or professional, then, then you need to invest in the pen and the pads. And now you can get down and split anything you want out with one of these things. The cheap ones of these run $100, and the more expensive ones run up to closer to 200 bucks. But now you can get right down into the area where you want to work and get it to do what you want. You're not yet you If you're if you're thinking about using a mouse or a trackball even for video editing or picture editing, when you buy it, look at the DPI. It'll be somewhere in the back of the package. It'll talk about how many dots per inch that thing can resolve. The more DPI it can resolve, the more accurately that mouse will track for you. Some of those little cheapo PS2 mice with the balls in there have a DPI of about 75. Right. The optical mice have ones around 400. I've even seen ones that are up, in the, up almost to 1,000 DPI. The better, the higher, the better. The more cost, and again, the problem that is going to be: can you move it slow enough and, and enough to, to make a difference? I have a problem sometimes with this one, getting it exactly where I want it, and then trying to get the button pressed. With the pens, that problem kind of goes away. Okay, these are some quick tips uh, that came out of PC World, where they kind of go through and talk about rotating your image and doing things. I would have been a lot more impressed if they picked something other than Photoshop Pro to do quick tips in. Uh, there's nothing quick about Photoshop Pro. It's a great program, don't get me wrong. It's just not an easy program. And how to straighten your pictures and crop the backgrounds and get things away again. Changing some of the lighting and the distance effects. Getting rid of red eye. Just the basic types of things. And we're going to go into those in a lot of detail with some of these packages. First one I'm going to run through, we're going to run through this one in detail, all, all 10 steps, is Smart Draw. It's a very nice, simple to use program. It's 50 bucks. Uh, what's nice about it is this. It has a whole bunch of online tutorials. It comes with a great manual. Actually has a manual with it. Actually you can read it. It has pictures you can see. They also have a newsletter which they send you not real regular, probably about every two or three weeks. It kind of varies a little bit with specific tips intense. This, before you go, they go in and start doing things, they're just telling you some basic things that you need to go through and straighten out in your photo about touching things up. Uh, one important thing that they don't, that nobody really emphasizes enough here, and that is saving your image. 
very, very important when you're doing editing. Save what's good and then change from there. Don't just keep going. When you save, if the picture is important and you're trying to get great resolution, do not save as a JPEG. Or if you have to save it as a JPEG, save it at 100%. Because JPEG compression loses image quality. And if you keep saving and saving and saving, it keeps going down and down and down and down. You're working against yourself. So keep that, if you have to work in JPEG, and I generally work in JPEG, okay? Just keep it set for 95, 99, or 100%. Yeah, the files are big, you know, an 80 gig drive's cheap. Again, if your camera supports it, if you have a TIFF format in your camera, and you have, you have important pictures on there, keep everything as a TIFF format. Tag, tagged image file format, there is no compression. It is a straight raw image coming out of your camera. Huge files, but they're nice to work with. Uh, this just goes through a bunch of things. This one is also linked. Touching up your images, talking about how to go through and rotate it. And what's nice about their tutorial here is they actually show you how to do the things, where the things are. Uh, one of my favorite criticisms of Photoshop and to some, to some extent PaintShop Pro, you click on the help files and they assume you know about three levels down in the menus because that's where they start. And if you don't know the first few places where you're at, you never seem to be able to find out where you're supposed to go to apply this help screen. This program takes you right from the top on everything and just runs you right down through rotating, straightening crooked pictures, and it, it's very, it has a very nice, simple, easy to use, intuitive interface. So if you, you want to do some things and they're somewhat elaborate, but they're not real detail type things, it's a good thing to work with. It's easy to use and it's not terribly expensive. Again, the cropping feature is very simple to use. It uses a standard tool. And one thing I want, to, want you to get out of this that I didn't put in here, we're going to go through two of these tutorials in detail. Every program has about the same features because there's only so much you can do. And they generally work very similar when you get down to them. The problem is getting down to them and how easy is it to find and how easy is it to use when you're there. So we're going to go through a couple of these. It doesn't matter which program you're using. MGI, MGI Paint Pro works the same way. Photoshop works, has the same features. It works a little different. Uh, Paint Shop Pro works the same way. Which one is this? This one here is Smart Draw. And you have a 30-day uh, trial on the CD when you get it. Uh, this CD, I can't burn it off. It just doesn't have all the extra stuff we've talked about on here. So if someone's really hot to try it, we can take care of that. Talks about exposures. We talked a little bit about that earlier on. And it talks about what these things mean, and it's linked off. A lot of these other links will go off. You'll need a website uh, connection to get to them. But they're talking about correcting exposure, underexposed, overexposed. They're talking about correcting their exposure. One of the nice things with their exposure program, correcting program is, you don't have to know a lot about it. All you do is click on the picture, it pops up this nine screen thing here. You can tell it more or less on these various areas and you can look what it does to these nine sets. You pick the set, it becomes the middle set, and then you can adjust from there. So it's a very optical, visual type process rather than a whole bunch of numbers on a screen that means something if you have the tables memorized which is the way it works in Photoshop. <laughs> but Photoshop can do a lot more. Again, they're showing you, you know, again, adjusting this, what they've done, taking the same image, one with poor contrast, and kicking up that contrast to make that stand out. Yeah. It was a non-picture when it was taken, and they made it a good picture by editing. Same here. The... <coughs> And you could do this with the uh, digital enhancement program that we talked about last week. It would do the same thing. Here the mid-tone range is wrong. The background's got a pretty good exposure on it, but you can't see the giraffe. So they went through and they clicked on it and they moved around. Actually, if they just adjusted the mid-tones, the background wouldn't have washed out like it did here, and the giraffe would have popped up a little bit more. Red Eye. This program has a fairly decent Red Eye program. Uh, not as good as what PaintShop Pro does, but uh, a, ver a very good program. You don't need to go in and color the eye like you have to do with some of the lower end programs. You can actually click on it and identify the eyes, and it will go through and do some of the adjusting for you. 
and from there to there is a pretty good change out. Restoring scratches in old photos. Uh, I always like this. This is an interesting thing. I'm working on a genealogy project and I have a lot of old photos. Some back from the 1850s, 1860s. I do have a tintype that you can't read or see, but it does scan and you can improve the quality on it quite a bit. And as long as the pictures are black and white or sepia tone, these scratch techniques work real well. But if you have some of the color photos and you try these things, it gets real interesting. In a black and white, you have 256 grayscale. Jump to color, we go to 16 million or 32 million. And uh, there's a lot of difference in that. Again, you've got a wizard on this program that will go through and you can, you can highlight areas. They're taking a scratch out from underneath the table down here. They've expanded it so you can see it. They, that's by selecting the area, they've actually applied an auto fix button to it, and it comes in and it will. They identify the area where they want to take it from, and they apply that image over the top to the top of the scratch to remove the scratch, and you can't see it. And that's essentially how you do that. And there's all kinds of tools that you can use to do that. And we'll talk about that when we get into some of the actual doing. Removing blemishes the same way. This lady has a mole here. They've come through and they've used a tool, either an auto tool or a wizard, or you can use a stamp. You don't ever want to use a brush tool or a roller if you're going to fix something because it just looks like you took a brush and you painted black on a white wall or a different color on a wall. There's no blending feature and it doesn't have the tonal range. So what you do is you select an image location close by and you use that to cover the area that you want to fix. You can use a stamping tool to do that. You can use an erasing tool to do that. All kinds of different ways to accomplish the same thing. Another trick when you get done covering up something like that. Blur tool. You come up through with a blur tool and you very lightly, notice I said lightly, blur the area around there. <clears throat> that basically just kind of averages the whole area together so you don't notice the sharp paintbrush edge as much. Right. The other thing when you, you can do if you're using a stamp tool or a uh, airbrush tool is uh, several of the programs have a two settings for the even for the brushes in uh, PaintShop where you can set the opacity, how much color is there, and you can set a flow rate. And if you're going to do retouching, the first thing I do is go to 50-50 on those. So it's only putting out half. It doesn't cover it the first time. You don't want it to cover the first time. You want to blend it in. You don't want to glob it on. Here they're talking about using the airbrush tool to soften things. They're also using it to blur the background in this photo here. This is very sharp. They want to, the emphasis should be on the person and the face. So they are changing that. They're coming through. They're selecting the area. They're using a polygon tool. Uh, some of these are automatic based upon a contrast ratio between the areas and you can generally set that. Some of them there's a uh, a magic lasso control in them where you get to draw those things around. Try to avoid those, they're hard to use. But sometimes that's what you have to do. Then they, they're getting the face effects here. They're pushing that into their comparison program again so you can work with it visually. It's, it's an easier way of doing things. You can see your changes. They have enhanced that. They've cut that out. They've taken the background now and now they're going to work on the background to blur it out. Or you, here they've actually converted the exposure, converted it over to black and white also. Straightening and whitening teeth. Again, similar technique. They've taken the teeth, they have highlighted the teeth with a polygon selection tool in this program. They've put that into their adjusting program and they've looked at what do you want to do in terms of either changing the ratio of the red, green, blue, or in changing the color highlights down here in terms of uh, increasing or decreasing the contrast and brightness. Get the one they want, pop it back in, and it's fixed. Applying special effects. This generally involves using filters or other things to change a picture or to blur a picture. There are sometimes things, times when you wish to do that, to blur out a background or blur out an area, and that's what they're doing, applying different uh, filters. We talked a little bit about that last week with the IRV and filters and stuff. And uh, which ones work are the ones that you want. 
some programs come with these things pre-built. Some of them are options that you buy and you, you load into it. Uh, this one here, they are making an oval vignette of a picture, and all they're doing here is they are just blocking out parts of this to highlight the center. And as you can see, they've cut out a lot of the emphasis of the chains and the seat and the swing to bring your emphasis in on the little girl. There's another technique on portraits called burning in or dodging, and that's where we used to, in the lab, you used to take and put your hand between the plate or the, the paper and the lens, and you held back the light on the exposure for where the person was, and you let the exposure continue out to the background. You quickly learn how that hand was supposed to be made to match that picture, and how high up and down that had to be, and how much to move that to, to achieve the desired effect. Uh, it's the same basic techniques, it's just a lot easier to apply them here, rather than working underneath a red light. Okay, that's the end of that guide. Leonard? Yes? I have a question for you. I have a photograph I've been working on that I pulled off the scanner, and the dark area, the shadowed area, more specifically, because it's like a bazillion colors in there, when I try to capture any kind of a, a selection from anywhere else, I'm, it's, it was, it's, it was done in white, the, the face has got a highlight to it, and there's a dark shadow on the sides that I want it to lighten up, you can't get a match on it anywhere, don't know how to get it to... Because there's so many colors, if you do any any one thing, it seems to come out like a blotch. Yeah, the uh, first thing I would probably do is enlarge that picture to as, as, as big as I can get it to work on it. Right. And depending upon what you have and what program you're working with, if you were in Photoshop, the first thing I would look at is some of the filters. Because there's, I don't know, I've got one disc that's got 700 Photoshop filters on the darn thing for doing everything you can possibly think of, and I'm sure there's a few thousand more out there. Uh, in a regular program, I would probably look at either using the paintbrush, the uh, clone brush tool or healing brush tool, depending upon what your package calls it, okay, cloning. Uh, stamping might be another technique, depending upon how that works, and moving that from a good area into a bad area. But you got to be very careful when you do that because the way clone brushes work, uh, they pick up, when you start them, you, you do like a control click and it picks the area, then you move it and you apply it. Then when you go to do it again, it has moved. So it's not back out where you think it is, so you have to go back out and reset it. Because if you don't, it'll, it'll pick up maybe the bad area and write that over the good area for you. Uh, I've got one where we did some uh, uh, editing and reflection on, on a pair of glasses. And that one was essentially almost pixel by pixel all the way through there, about 45 minutes to take the reflection off of a pair of these metal frame glasses that we all like to wear, okay, to get that out of it. But that's how you probably would have to do that. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I did a trick where uh, I wanted to create a new driveway alongside my house. And if I just went and grabbed the old driveway and put it over there, it looked very fake. If you saw two exactly the same images next to each other, it looked like I grabbed and copied it over. So I went and grabbed it as a whole series of random chunks out of the original driveway, distributed them randomly over here, and then blurred them all together. So if you've got something like that where if you just grab a chunk and it looks really fake, grab it in different random pieces all the way around there, sew it in random pieces, and blur it together so you don't see the edges anymore. Well, this, this one primary area that I'm struggling with the most is the side of her face. So you want some shadow in there to give you some depth. You can always have the shadow back after you fix the, the, the rest of the features. Again, if, if when you're applying whatever you're applying, you're, you're using either the copy or a stamp or the clone brush, go back up and look at those settings for what the, how much opacity you have and what the flow rate is, because that will leave... Saturation, some, is that the word? Uh, saturation. Saturation. Okay. Or saturation generally refers to color. Okay. Uh, these, these are the, um, the, the amount of paint, if you'll think of it that way, that you're using. Speed. Speed could be one thing that... There's all kinds of different names for these same things. Here. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to get back to where I was an easy way here and that return to index. Mm. Okay. fails cheat <laughs> okay 
that's what it has to be fixed. All right. Okay. This one here is an amazing tutorial I'm going to show you. It's a flash presentation, so you will need flash on your machine to view this. The flash loaders are on the disk. This comes with, it's one of many, and I have all the tutorials listed. No, I didn't download them all. I'll probably fill a disk uh, for using PaintShop Pro. To use this, just open it. Browser comes up, click on open. And we will go through this one, because I don't have to tell. These are the various and the sundry basic areas that you can work with. You put them up, and it gives you the different things here. This is how you get the stuff into the program. So you don't have to download it through your camera software. You can download it directly into the package you're going to work with. I have not used my camera download software outside of maybe the first three or four months I had the camera. Uh, my camera is a serial hookup, and it's just an absolute bear to get pictures out of. The flash card reader solves all those problems. What's nice about this one is watch. No. Again, what's very nice about this is you're actually seeing the mouse clicks so that you don't have to try to read where are they telling me to go to because I can't find the words that get me there. Again, if you noticed, that's the standard image that you saw back in Smart Draw for cropping. It's the same one that Microsoft uses in its product. Not the one Photoshop uses, but that's another story. <laughs> If you're running this program, this tutorial is available to you. You can click on the tutorial. You can bring the whole thing up. Uh, I've gone out and rounded up all the pieces since I kind of know what to look for. And I've got them stuck out there on the CD in a separate directory so you can go run any one anytime you want to. Beats a man. Watch the red eye effect on this one. They found it. Can do automatic color balance. They're adjusting it for temperature. They're taking it from daylight down to essentially a tungsten rating. I was color adjustment. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. One here's one. This is the one I want you to see. Again, they're adjusting. They're selecting the red eye tool. Notice down here they have a section you can set the color of the eyes from their choice if you'd like the children to have brown eyes or green eyes just select on that button and away they go but watch the way this one works just click on the eye close to the center it blocks the eye out you click OK and they are done and you can always see your image they, they work in the left they show you in the right image on what you're going to get scratch removal again a black and white photo, but watch. It's relatively simple to do. They're essentially going to clone a piece over. Just like the other program did. There's what they want to scratch out. They picked a rectangle tool, drawing tool. They're picking an area that they want to get rid of. The effect small scratch removal from that area the 
it's showing you here, they're going to remove it, and it's gone. A lot more difficult with color, it doesn't work that easy. Again, with black and white, it's very easy to do. Cloning, copying something from one place to another, making two, or using a clone tool to remove something, which they're going to do here. There's objects in the foreground that you don't want. easy to take something out. They're going to do some retouching on this one, and they're going to blur some stuff on here. Too. Again, an interesting composition of photo. This is your central point and your focus. This is all distraction from a composition standpoint. Hard to go back and take that vacation photo over again, but watch. Notice they're changing the size of the brush. And they call it hardness here. That's a, some of those same types of tools we were talking about. You generally never want to work with these tools at 100% because it looks just like you took a magic marker and drew it across picture across the picture. Now you have an interesting photo. Your eye is drawn back into that blurred background. Layers. When you're into the more sophisticated programs, this is the essentially the, the, the quintessential element. You kind of got to master layers, and I'm kind of working on that one. Because what layers does is it lets you put your picture in one area, and what you want to do, another picture, a frame, an object in another layer, or something else in another layer, and then you can decide how these parts and pieces go back together again. When you're working with a CAD program, you take and you draw the basic building layout. You draw it one time. Then you put in an electrical plan. You put in a telecommunications plan. You put in a land plan. Then when you want to, pre and you can put furniture in. You can put room numbers in. You can do everything. It's one picture. You can print the whole picture as one. Or if somebody wants to look at just the room, you can print out a particular layer. So it's a way to do it, keep it separate, but make all the changes. and only have to do it one time and be able to adjust each of the layers and that's what they're going that's what that's the main advantage and feature of using layers they're selected which is the active picture or active layer to work on going to make a new layer. are surrounded by the leaves, but they are still two separate pictures. <clears throat> they just use a rectangular cut tool, but you could have used an oblong tool or a fancy tool, and you could have put one picture inside of another picture so it becomes a picture frame around something. Those are some of the things we're going to cover in, uh, number, in demonstration number three. Masking is a similar type of proposition. They're going to do actually, actually put things in pictures here for you in frames and stuff. It's all the same technique that's being used. Okay. This is their tutorial. The whole the whole thing's a 13 megabyte file out there on the disk.
And now you have a frame filter. Christmas with all the rebates you could this for $99 bucks download, $109 in a box. <coughs> the tutorial alone makes it worth this. And I'll, when we get this thing gets finished running, we got several more to go through yet. I'll, uh, I have the list of all of the tutorials they have out there. This is the, just the general tutorial for the program. But if you want these types of running tutorials for specific subjects, they have them there on their website. Again, that broadband connection does help. You can email straight out of this program. Uh, one of the things which is very, very important to remember when you're emailing photographs, particularly for those who have higher resolution cameras, there's generally a limit on how big an email file can be. It doesn't take too many three megapixel camera pictures to exceed five megabytes. So you, you need to go through and reduce the image uh, DPI down through uh, resizing your image and reducing the resolution down on it so you can send it. If it's, only, if it's going to be viewed on a CRT screen, it only needs to be 72 dpi. Substantial reduction in size. Most of the pictures out on our website uh, are 100 dpi, only because that's where my scanner happens to work, and I don't have to go back and readjust the darn things. It's a little lazy sometimes. Usually if I'm emailing photos to friends and stuff, I'll... I'll knock them down to about 640 by 480, which is yeah. full, which is almost full screen. They have an email client frame up around there, so they can see the whole thing on one shot. I used to send full resolution pictures, and everyone would complain that they could only see my nose, and I have to tell them, right? You have to zoom down by clicking on this, right? So you just send them the 640 by 480; it all fits right there in the pane. And they want a good permanent copy later on. I'll mail them a CD with the with the full resolution photo on it. They have a number of other uh, adjunct programs and, and features that you can do with this where they can stick things out on websites and you can put them on CDs and the whole nine yards. Here they're using their web server to serve pictures where you can put your pictures up on their web server. You can give somebody the URL uh, to their server and your, your area on their server and you can share your pictures on there. It's a no cost operation. Which program is that? I beg your pardon? Which program is that? Many, many do this. This, is, this one's Paint Shop Pro. If uh, you're going to buy a program and you're into the higher end stuff, it's probably the one I would recommend. How about you, Elements 2? Which one? Uh, Photo Shop Elements 2. Uh, yeah, that's the one that's supposed to be coming out. I don't know. Did it, has it made its premiere yet? It's out. It is out now. I haven't had a chance to look at it. I have looked at the reviews. Uh, it is a scaled-down version of Photoshop 6, uh, which is a very good program. Uh, and depending upon how they implemented it, it could be very good or very bad. Uh, if they change the menus around so that they make some sense and the interface is, is usable, uh, then it would be a very good program. If they just took and made a subset of Photoshop with its existing difficult to use menus and hard to understand things, then it's not such a good program. It'll do good quality work, it just is it's hard to get there from here. It got higher ratings than Photoshop 6. Yeah, but, but it's a different audience, okay? <laughs> well, from the experts. Yeah, yeah. It, it wouldn't be hard to get a higher rating than Photoshop 6 or Photoshop 7 if you're talking about usability. It's very... <laughs> not, not, not hard at all. <laughs> well, you can buy it at Sam's. I bought it for 99 with a $30 rebate. Eight. And you can buy it at Sam's for 
It's either 59 or 69 for the $30 rebate. Here's the optimization. We'll run that one. I'm just going to skip over the others so we have some time. This is where they're going to go through it and change the compression ratio on something to get it down to where the, the, the size of the file will, will decrease. Will decrease. $99. Download jasic.com, J A S C.com. Okay, let's get out of this. We should go back to where we were. That's amazing. Uh, that's essentially that part of editing. We're going to look, talk a look, look a little bit at Photoshop and what it can do. And I have a section down here where we can come back and I'll, I'll show you the badges. And if we have time, we'll do some editing on it, but I don't want to get involved in that. We can spend hours on some. I'll show you some where we have spent, I've spent that. Okay. Working with Photoshop Pro. The main problem that you have when you're trying to edit and fix pictures is the camera sees one thing and we see another. We don't see with a lens. There's a lens in our eye and there's a retina, which is a piece of film. But we don't see that. We see with what's between our ears, our brain. And our brain has perceptions. And the camera doesn't have the same ones. So when it, you get your pictures out, they don't look like what you want. One of my favorite subjects, and the one we talked about the last time, was white balance. White balance is a good thing. When I was taking publicity shots in college, I would have killed to have a camera that did white balance. We had worked under sodium vapor lights, mercury vapor lights, fluorescent lights of four or five different colors. And, you know, outside and inside under different types of lights, stage lights, and they all wanted colored pictures, of course. And you spent most of your day figuring out which filter would do what to get you the right color balance. It would be so nice to have had a digital camera where you could just shot the picture and not worry about it. For some things, it's great. Here is a very nice stylized fall picture in the woods. And that is what I saw when I took that picture. However, that is not what my digital camera saw. That's what it saw and that's what it gave me. It has adjusted for white balance. It has killed the whole mood of that photograph. It wouldn't be bad, but there were 75 photographs taken that way and it did about 60 of them wrong. So there was a lot of adjusting to get these things back into alignment. There's some I'm still working on, some close-ups of stumps and moss-colored logs where I wished I had my slide camera. I wouldn't have had the problems. So white balance can be good or bad. It would be nice if there was a switch where you could just turn the darn thing off and let it go take the picture the way you saw it. And this is what you're dealing with. How do you get from what you saw and what you want from what the camera took? It could be a particular problem in outdoor photographs and getting there, and there's lots of things that you can do to post-process to get there. Uh, we've talked about some of those uh, the other day, uh, last meeting, when we are going through adjusting the overall contrast of pictures. This is Photoshop's way of doing it, and you can see the difference where they've gone through. This was the original picture, and they have applied some filters to get it back, to take the blue haze out to get back to the actual image. does a great job. It's probably about 15 or 20 steps to get there. Sharpening pictures, uh, unmasking, a whole bunch of stuff on how to go through things in Photoshop. And it's just click after click after click after click. Very powerful package. Can do a lot. Removing elements that you don't want. Who cares? Again, some close up photography. This part isn't wanted, they only want this part. So, you know, what do you do to get rid of this one? This photo here, they were concerned about the trash in the picture. Personally, I'd be very concerned about the lake sticking out in the middle of no place. And again, they've gone through, they've magnified the area they want to work on so that they, they can get the picture up bigger. They've selected the stamp tool. Same types of things we've been talking about, just a different program. Picked an area over here, selected that as a target, and then moved that down over the area and just started applying that stamp to wipe that out and blend it into this background. 
Same thing here. We got a, a very good picture of the cat, but we have a lot of distraction in here. So they wanted to get rid of the garden hose. You wouldn't paint over it. What they've done is they've gone and they've taken some pictures some of these areas and they have moved them over the garden hose to cover the garden hose up. Showing you how to do that, they've selected a little target here, they've applied that in a couple places. What they didn't show you is you can't just take this target from here and apply it to this whole area because this thing is not yellow all over. So you do it here, you do it here, you do it here, you do some here, you do it here, you do it here, you do it here, you do it here. And it's, it, that's why I talk about you, know, you need that mouse that can get down there and can find those points because those points are very important. And the, the more points you can pick and lay over, the more natural it will look as you go through. As you can see, that's what they're showing here where they've taken that out. They erased the trash here, but they still left this leg sticking out in the middle of no place. Lord knows why. And you know, after probably about 40 minutes of work, you got that. Now, if you were taking that picture and you had a pair of snips along with you, you could have followed that picture probably in about four or five seconds. <laughs> and that's why I say, uh, think about what's going on, take better pictures. It's a lot easier than fixing them. Okay. If you're going to work with Photoshop, you kind of get, you kind of want to know Bert uh -huh. Monroe. He is the Monroe. He is the guru in Photoshop. He writes all the texts and all the things and whatnot and what you can do. He's a frequent visitor to the Screensavers on Tech TV and has a website out there where he deals with questions and answers and answers email. And this is one of his clips that we're going to run. Tons of email asking for help. With Photoshop, how do you do that kind of email? So today he's picked uh, three of uh, the questions he's getting the most for uh, answering on the show. Bert Monroy, welcome back to the screensaver. So it's good to be here. So these are the questions that you've received more than one. More than one, at least five. At least five. five people. Yeah, I like to keep okay. it that way. Yeah. That's good. Do you get a lot of emails? I get a, I was just telling uh, Yoshi that after a show, I'll need to get about 75 to 100 emails. Wow. And I answer them all. You actually answer them. I do answer them. Very nice guy. You have like boilerplate that you Flow in in there. some cases, yeah. Like when they ask, what, what is that little pencil you're using? This little wacko tablet. Yeah. It's a really tablet for his editing tool. Here. Paste uh, right in there. My paste answer. answer. It's a wacko tablet. So I, do that. So I, do that. So I do that. I have about 20 different standard replies. All right, let's start with uh, something that I used to call stitching. It's taking scans and putting them together. Right now, there is a program called Stitcher, which okay. is more for combining pictures for when you're doing walkthroughs and things right. like that. This is a little different. This is you get scanners nowadays, and you get them free. I'm going to with two thousand dollars. Now you get them free. Well, uh, they're limited in size. So let's just say you have a poster to uh, scan in. You have to scan it in pieces, and then you got to put it together. Okay. So putting it together, that's the hard part. Now, actually, with Photoshop, it's not so hard. This is a quick well, I'm going to show you a quick trick. Now, this is uh, like my son's an artist. He draws traditionally. What's his name? His name is Sean. Sean's actually in the studio. And, he's and, and, and this is an old uh, one of his comics. An old comic. So he does new stuff. This is cool, though. This is a pen and ink. Pen and ink. And it was huge. It's huge. So I have to scan them in in a couple of places. Okay. So, to put them back together, here we see the bottom portion right here. So you now, did the top and then you did the now bottom. Now you notice that there's some of this in here, okay? It overlaps. So you need that overlap because that's what you're going to use as a point of reference okay. to match things up. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to take this image and increase the canvas size. So it's big enough to hold the whole thing? Big enough. So I'm, I'm figuring it's about 14 inches. I'm going to give it a little extra, make it 15. And since this is the top of the image, I'm going to make sure it's on the top. So use the arrow to say expand from the bottom. From the bottom down, okay. right. Click OK, and it's going to give me all this extra room down there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one back here, that's this guy, and just drag him in to this image here. Oh, and if well, that's right handy. In, you can yeah. just drag the images. Just so. drag it right in there. So now... When we look at the whole image, there is a whole image. But the thing is now, how do we match them up? Right. Now, it's pretty close. But it's pretty close. But you can see right there. You can see this. Okay. Now, what you want to do is you want to make it extremely accurate. So what I do is I'm going to go and change the mode of that layer. I'm going to change it to difference. Now, this is an interesting layer mode. Difference. Difference. It's telling me what's different between this layer and what's underneath it. Whenever everything is exactly the same, like the white, it shows up as black. Anything that's white here is what's different from the layers beneath. So the white stuff is the differences. Exactly. So using the uh, move tool on the cursor keys, I'm just going to go in there and start moving this guy up until I got a nice little match and move him over to the right a little bit. You want it to disappear. To the left, and let's go up. 
One close, 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 close. And we would miss something get worse. Warm, cold, warm. Yep. Can you do it a pixel at a time? Pixel at a time, which is what I'm moving right now. And let's go up, up. And there's where, there's where we're off. Now I'm seeing it. And we're going to go right in there and over, up, up. Now it's taking too long because it's not matching up perfectly. It never would on national television. Yeah, so you can only do that at home. Yeah. But it actually works. We did it before the show. It's really quite amazing. Works. It goes black. So you're just going to do it until this disappears. There we go. That's, that's close, close enough. enough. And once it's completely black, that means they're perfectly matched up. Okay. And then what happens is you put it back into normal mode. You go back into normal mode. And then you can flatten the file. That's pretty and good. It comes Look at that. Bar. Perfect match. Okay. All right. So that, okay, that's one. That's it. Uh, get rid of that. And we have that, by the way, on our website if you want to get the details on that. Now, this one is for um, distortions caused by the digital camera. Yes. The, the lens, you have limited the lens that comes with the camera and so on. As you can see in this image, the buildings are kind of twisting in towards the top of the image. That'll happen with a film camera if you don't have a view camera. Anytime exactly. you're taking, the, the, the perspective gets messed up. That's right. right. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to go in there and distort this image to compensate for the distortion of the... Uh, so the the buildings don't look like they're falling in towards us. Exactly. Now, what I'm going to do is to give myself a guide. I'm going to say, show my grid, okay. which I previously changed to red so I can really stand out. Okay. And I'm going to pull back a little bit so I can have the work area visible back here. And what's going to happen is I'm going to duplicate the image into a separate layer, like that. And using my distort tool, and I'm going to hold down the shift key to constrain it. I'm going to pull this guy out. So and you can see the building is starting. Look, it's straightening up. It's straightening up right in there. And I can see on this side, I'm going to pull it out. And I straighten it awesome. up right in there. I'm going to New York this weekend. And now I can make sure that my skyscraper yeah. pictures look good. I click OK. And I can take away the grid. And there you and go. And we see the, All there's the before. And there's oh, the that's a big difference. Very simple technique just to compensate for that distortion. The last one is what people often want to do. Take somebody's head yeah. and put it on somebody else's it's body. Exactly. Just, just, just yesterday I got two emails about this one right here. Now this, you picked a tough one because this bird has feathers that are going to be very difficult to get the edge of that. That's right? the whole point. Yeah, if you can't use the lasso for something like this, it's hard to use any of the tools for something like this. This is where the extract command comes Does in. Does it help that it's all green in the background or does that matter? Uh, no, it doesn't matter. What you do want is enough contrast between the elements. Okay, if this bird was against a white background, that would be hard. Hard. really hard. But since it is against me, in fact, I'm going to go along the bottom of the body there. Okay. All you need is a contrast between them. So I go into my extract command, which is under filters. It's the first one right here, extract. And you're going to see the image right in there. Now, what's going to happen is I start off with this little marker pen, and I start to trace the area. And what I want to do is I want to have a brush that's big enough so that I can center so I'll have on both sides of my brush, I'll have the outside and the inside parts. Because it needs to see both. It needs to see both. So okay. You're telling it where it's going to go in there. Okay. So you don't have to be that accurate, though. No. Nope. I'm going to go in there, and I'm just going to trace around okay. this entire part of... Uh, Boy, I used to do there. this by hand. This makes it so much easier. Real easy. Let's just get a little extra in there. Now, you've got to tell the program which part do I want, the outside or the inside. That's where the bucket comes in. Okay. All I do is click inside there. That's what I want. And now I say, OK. Oh, no. If this works, and it's just, look at that. Now, keep in mind Perfect. that it got rid of the background, so it's good to work with the duplicate right. rather than working with right. the actual original file. Yes. That's so what we now we have say. another image back here, so I can now take this bird and just drag him over into this guy here. <laughs> and uh, we'll put him in position. Right on top of the A hawk polo player. Yeah, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to... You zoomed in. I zoomed in so we can see the little head there. Now, you see the stick going through it. So I earlier put the stick in a separate layer. So it's right here. So if I move the stick now in front of it, then you have this stick uh -huh. going across. Oh, uh, look at that. So what happens look is you have a new player. Bert, so you're brilliant. Bert Monroy, ladies and gentlemen. His book is called Photoshop Studio. Beautiful, fine art using Photoshop. And the website, of course, BertMonroy.com, where Bert has so many of his own images. They're just gorgeous. You've got to see them. If you... Okay. A couple things, couple things on that. Uh, on the first one where he's showing you how to put them together, how simple and easy that was. With, with most scanners and most digital cameras, there's generally a program called Stitcher. And you can use it with your scanner, even though it came with your digital camera. Just make sure that you save it in the same format that the camera works with. Give it both pieces of the picture, and for 90% of everybody sitting here, I'll guarantee you to put them together just right and about as fast as you can click. And it saves an awful lot of grief and aggravation. And that was the point of what we are talking about last week. It's, you know, there's different tools for different things, and trying to do everything with one doesn't work. It's like using a screwdriver for a chisel. 
you know, yeah, you get the job done if you wreck the screwdriver. Um, on the one there where he was showing you the buildings, that problem is in photography is called parallax, and we did architectural photography, we used a view camera like he said. View cameras, you can adjust the plane of the lens and the plane of the film pack in the back, and you actually took the camera and you raised the lens and tilted it back, and you did the same with the back so they were parallel, so they would remain in focus. If you didn't, then you'd lose the focus. If you wanted to lose the focus on the top, that was the way to do that. And you took your picture that way and you solved that problem when you were taking the pictures. Uh, view cameras date back to about the 1840s, 1860s, I mean, you know, new technology. Uh, the last one is one of the, the real nice things of Photoshop, again, with a very large collection of filters, and the PC, the uh, PaintShop Pro works the same way. If you had to try and draw everything around those little feathers, and I have spent days doing that, uh, it's a real problem. But using that feature, and again, the, the upper-end programs will make that easier. The lower-end programs are going to require upon you to go out and do that. And again, uh, I haven't done it in uh, Paint Shop, but in uh, Photoshop, he talked about the importance of it being a contrast between the two. There is a contrast setting tool in there where you can set that number in a percentage relationship between the two unknowns. Uh, and I say that because that's a lot of what the problem is with the select tools. When you're using Paint Shop, you have no idea what the two numbers are, so what's 10%, 15%, or 20%, so you just get to click and do click and click and click and click and keep trying. So you can't set that ratio, so if the, the background was a slight off-white, and it was still the white head, you could probably go in there and tell there was a 5% or 10% variance between those two colors, they'd pick it right up and care, they wouldn't care. Uh, very, very good feature. They talked about his book, uh, it is available out there. And not just about just pushing his book at this particular point, but any of the books in Photoshop's probably got more books written about any other thing I can think of except maybe Windows. Uh, one good thing to do for the books before you go out and buy these things, because you know most of them are 30, 40, 50 bucks, go off to one of the big book sites, Amazon.com. Uh, didn't capture that. No, just not. And they generally have a a preview area where you can go out and take a look at the thing so you can get an idea of what's in that book. They'll at least have the tables of contents and in the indexes available for you. In this one, there are 50 plus pages of a 250 page book out there. And uh, they're usable, readable, and uh, you can essentially find out whether you want the book or whether you just get enough information that way. Well, it's free. And these are all the capturing pages, by the way. They're out there. They're all thumbnailed and cross-linked to you. Now, for those of you who would like to learn a little bit more about this and actually have a course taught to you by Bert, uh, it's going to involve some fun and a great time. If you'd like to, you, you can go off there and we'll get you all signed up for this. I don't think you're going to get your boss to pay for it. For a cruise, it's going to take place in June for a week where they're going to have a Photoshop cruise. <laughs> and Bert is clinically insane, in case you're wondering, so... I think it's further than clinical. <laughs> uh, I have seen other shows that he's put on. Uh, he can take Photoshop as a blank canvas and draw it and draw a photograph or draw a picture with it. Uh, you see a lot of the techniques like the starting artist who can draw an island and palm trees and birds flying, you know, the whole nine yards in there just from scratch. The the guy is amazing what he can do with this thing. I'm going to click on this quickly, but I'm not going to go through and show you how we do it. How many of you bought the Christmas CD? Did you notice what happened to the cover on here? Probably not now. That's an hour's worth of my life on that cover, okay? Here is the original cover. When you put the hole in the center, several things happen. The man's head pops up on the top of it. You can't get in position so it's not there. And then after I removed his head and a bunch of other things in here, which took about 40 minutes to straighten this out, I then discovered that his shadow was in here after I printed off a couple of the labels. So another 15 or 20 minutes taking out the shadow. So now there is no person here or visible. Over an hour's worth of editing to do that. I probably could have made snow and went and got a Christmas tree. Easy. Again, we thought our bad pictures are bad. That's the one they gave me. That's what we did with it. We'll come back to this one. 
This is my picture. This was just a picture that I had taken for another purpose, and that's what the final ended up with. A lot of cropping, which is a very simple technique, got rid of the extra arm and the door, but we had a crease and different colors back here, and just by going through, and this was actually just drawn in, I selected one of these colors on a brush and enlarged the picture and just went around and filled in the background. Relatively simple and easy. These are one of my favorite pictures, you guys. I don't know how many pictures we have. This is the only one with a yellow thing. Usually it's a white object, like a letter or something sticking out of a jacket. Uh, go through, pick a piece of his shirt, copy it down over it, and burn it out. Also, I've been known to give people haircuts and pick up the loose flying hair. I have uh, given the ladies some, some new sets. I have color, changed the colors of their blouses and things of that nature because it blended into the backgrounds and so on and so forth. This is a picture of Earl Solomons. Uh, this was the before picture. Uh, you may not be able to see it there. There are two different colors of background and uh, one of those nice aluminum posts sticking out of his ear. And that is the picture afterwards. This is JC's picture. He's our membership chairman that uh, they gave me to work with. Uh, nice, picture. nice picture. Nice clock in the head, doorway around the side of it. Again, going through cropping took care of some of it, but not the clock in the doorway. And picking this up and straightening out. And uh, JC didn't need a haircut. He didn't pay me the 10 bucks for one of those either, by the way. Uh, so that's the types of things you can do. Okay, Dad, go back to JC's picture real quick. Notice in his shirt pocket, in the original yeah. photo. Oh, yeah. It's there. That was not cropped out. He has on a striped shirt. Lots of fun getting that one lined up right and rotated the correct way. Okay. <laughs> so they're not quite as, you know, they look bad, but uh, they're really a lot worse people. This is one we did of Kevin. He needed a picture for employment. Uh, Kevin, like me, wears glasses. And we got reflection here. We got the reflection on the glasses. Here's the picture afterwards. About an hour. How could you eliminate that with a camera or light? Uh, with my camera, you wouldn't have been able to because my flash attachment is about that far from the lens. Polarized filter would do it? No. You, the problem, it, it may have because you had a glass reflection. You notice I was able to get the red eye. I didn't have any red eye in the original picture. Okay? Because of way I had my camera a little higher than what he was and had him look just slightly down so I wasn't in line with his eye when I took that picture. That's one of the ways to eliminate red eye. Uh, to get this out, it, it's very hard. Because you got the, you got the glass reflection and you got the metal reflection in here. If I had a bounce flash, and I probably would have put a handkerchief over the top of it to soften it, and that would have cut a lot of the reflection out, you still would have had some. But again, when you got the, you know, with Photoshop, it was a matter of just taking, stamping the eye around to overcover the reflection. And on these glasses, it was essentially a point and a click, a, a select and a click, back, select, click, each one moving forward, just, you know, an hour's worth of work. And, you know, we edited about this much picture, okay? And you can do that with other, with other tools. Uh, and there may have been easier ways to do that. Uh, JC, for example, instead of doing all this work on here, if I had gone through and used the filter tool, the extract command, I could have pulled them out and slammed them on a, the back wall over here. You know, a lot of the problems would have went away. Uh, probably couldn't have fixed the shirt, though. Okay? And I don't want to... We can go into the detail of that if you want. But I hate to do those kind of demos. Okay, what do you got on the disk? Uh, we've got Photoshop 7, the trial edition. It's good for 30 days. You can go off and get aggravated all you want with it. Uh, we have the PaintShop Pro program. Uh, we have downloaded a lot more. We have downloaded essentially everything they have on their website that uh, they offer for free downloads. That's all on the disk in underneath their under programs under uh, PaintShop Pro. Uh, on their website, they maintain a complete list of the splash type utilities that go through and show you how to do each one of these things and you can download that. This for most people is probably the best program to buy if you're going to buy one to do things with. It's a little overkill for a lot of the simple things but it is capable of doing a lot of the more complicated things 
that you would probably want Photoshop or some of the other programs to do. And it won't break your bank either. Smart Draw, uh, again, uh, a nice low-end program, 40, 40 bucks, $45 range. It's simple to use. It has a lot of the features. What's nice about it is it's a good manual, and it has that online tutorial, and there are more tutorials out there that will take you through it step-by-step step on how to do it. So if you're learning, it's, it's a good beginning package. i got Digital Photo out there, Easy Photo Maker, Turbo Photo 2, and a bunch of other stuff out there. And this last one here is something I want to talk about. It's called Photo Rescue, and smart media cards like floppy disks and hard drives, when you tell it to erase my picture, your picture really isn't gone. You just can't see it anymore because it has taken away the markers for it. You can recover that, and that's what this program does. Remember, you can always recover, or some people could recover for you, I guess is a better term, things that you had deleted from floppy drives or things you had deleted from your hard drive. We can go back and get them back by turning them back on again in the file allocation table. Same thing here, and this program does smart media cards. There's got to be some out there for memory sticks. There's got to be some out there for all the cards. I haven't found them yet. I truthfully haven't gone looking for them either. But I'll bet they're out there. So just because you've erased your favorite picture on your camera storage medium doesn't mean it's gone. Just don't record a lot of other stuff to it because you may overwrite it. And somebody can get it back for you. And that concludes this tutorial. Yeah. Any questions or anything you want to try to talk about? Yes, sir. When you said those programs, is that on the disk that you have next? The programs, there's, there's, there's going to be three number one disks. There's one from last month. That's the one that's here. I have this one here in this present state of work, and they are on the work disk. And if you want that, I can burn it for you. It doesn't have the other stuff in here that I want to put and talk about. But this disk will be available next month in a completed disk. But if you're, you know, if you really need it now, I'm sure we can fix you right up. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> then let's not. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask something that's, that's kind of primitive, but I don't understand the differences between JPEG bitmaps, um, the T, what do you call it, tag image files, tag yeah. tips. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What's what I know I know that when I save stuff, when I go to actual view, it's like you know, it covers my postage block stamp. That's that's a different problem. Um, I'll to think where it is. One of these, I think in that uh, first tutorial on taking better pictures, if I remember right, there is an explanation in there, a very good one, on comparing and showing you the difference between a GIF file and a JPEG file. One, two, or two? No, on this one here. Uh, a brief explanation. A GIF file is a CompuServe proprietary format. They have been unsuccessful at uh, enforcing their copyright on, thank God. Uh, it is a lost less format. It doesn't lose any image quality. The only problem with it is it only supports 256 colors. So you won't find too many pictures of people in GIF files. You'll find a lot of clip art in it. And the advantage of it is, since it is lost less, you can generally expand the file and you don't lose any image quality. It will stay with you. A JPEG file is a lost image quality saving format. And what it, and it, will, it can support up to 32 million colors. What they do there is they look at each number what represents that color, and they compare those to the next number, and the next number, and the next number. So instead of saving four number sixes in a row, it just tells you that there are four number sixes there rather than six, 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 six. Okay? And the more compression that you use, that compresses it. They also may decide, if you decide to depress it at a lower level, then what it'll say is, okay, we're saving a number six, but a number five looks like a number six, and so does a number seven. So I'll save all those as sixes. So, so yeah, now your quality starts to go to heck. And if you would save it as I only want to save it at 50% instead of 80%, then it will say that numbers three through nine look like a number six. So it makes a smaller file, but the image that it produces is not sharp and is, it starts to look funny. 
And if you keep saving it and you keep changing your compression ratios, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. If you don't believe me, pick one, save it about 20 times compared to the first one. It'll kind of look like a block. Okay, then the TIF. TIF is a non loss <laughs> file format. It's not a compression format at all. Okay. It is everything. So each, each individual. Uh, each pixel is there. Each pixel is there 100%, not color for color. But it takes up a lot of room? Oh, yeah. A, a, JIF, a, a JPEG file, even with high levels of compression, 95%. Compresses a video file, a, a picture file, down somewhere to 75% of the original size. A TIFF file coming out of a medium format camera. Now these are cameras that take pictures in the 10 to 15 megapixel range. Represents a 20 megabyte file. They're hell to edit. Chuck, <laughs> bitmap format. What about? Explain it. Uh, okay. Um, I just know it's big. Yeah, it's big, and the reason it's big is there's no compression. Right. And with the, so it's with, like a TIFF. It's like a TIFF. Yeah. What it's they, Microsoft's they, version. <laughs> it's Microsoft's version of TIFF, and basically what they do is they take um, each pixel and assign it a color value, right? Okay. A, a number between basically like 0 and 256. That's a byte. So each pixel is a byte on that image. So if you have an image of 640 bits by 480 bits, it takes 640 times 480. That's the number of bytes you're going to have in that file. That's why they're so big. Okay. There's, there's no compression at all. The, advantage of, the reason they do that is that they're, because it's no compression and it's, it's raw like that, it's very easy to work with, very easy to manipulate for software. Okay, so in order to actually maintain value of a photograph, mm -hmm. if I worked on it in a bitmap format, mm -hmm. Finished it and then saved it as a JPEG and got rid of the bitmap. Mm -hmm. yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Now keep in mind though that you know if you ever want to go back and edit, right? You only got the JPEG now. Right. You still right. you still need to save both. <laughs> okay. That's what in the third session we're going to talk about things to do, you know, interesting and funny things to do with your camera. But one of the important parts of that is a very dull subject, which deals with saving and archiving your photos and, and right. photo management, Good. and it becomes even more of a problem and saving and keeping track of all of your word processing documents in your spreadsheets because you've got compressed formats, uncompressed formats, unedited format, raw formats, finished formats. And how do you keep track of all that stuff and how do you find it? Okay. Yeah, generally Just speaking, for, for archival purposes, you always want to save it as a TIFF or a bitmap file. right? And that, that'll, that those, have, those are zero loss. I mean, they're big, right? but they're zero loss. Are and bitmap and TIFF? Yeah, they're, they're, they're different. They're different in, internally, but they're but they're basically the same kind of concept, right? We don't we don't throw anything out. Okay. Okay. We keep all the original material there. Um, TIFF is actually some is actually the original fax scan, the original fax image for transmitting fax documents back and forth. It's been around forever. Okay. But um, the you always want to save your archival stuff in a lossless format like bitmap or TIFF. There's a couple others that are out there as well. It means they're big but it means you don't lose anything. So you can bring that in, you can edit it, you can do whatever you want, but you don't actually lose any of the original image quality. JPEG, JPEG was, uh, works by looking at some things in the photo and, and said, you know, we know from the studies of the human brain and the human eye that you probably can't notice if I took this out. Okay? Right, in theory, right? right? And how much of that stuff we throw away depends on the compression level. The more we throw away, the more likely you are to notice it, but the smaller the file gets. So if you say so like a JPEG at 50% quality, it's going to be... Very small file, but there's a lot of stuff. There's more stuff around. They say JPEG at 75% quality. Okay, so you don't. So the nice thing about JPEGs is they're small, and I can send them back and forth over email and over the web and stuff like that for reasons because they are very small. The bad thing though is that my original image is no longer really there. There's things missing to it, and where it becomes important, like that little shadow thing you've been working with, that's saved as a JPEG. There's little tiny bits of it's color in there that are gone. Right. So when you yeah, try to go back and edit that, you really don't have the original material to kind of clone with and work with. In JPEG, is there, a, is there a software that will reverse that? No. You can take a gone, it's gone. gone, gone. You, you, can, you, can, you can take a JPEG and convert it back to a bitmap, right? But the original image, the original pieces are gone. So you can't take anything off the internet and then and the run to a software that you can blow it up without pixel Nope. Once it's gone, it's gone. Right. This, this is what you're looking at on the screen here, are my current photo file directory. 
stuff. And I keep this here. I keep this in off on CDs. I keep it off on my backup drive. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't want to lose them. When I when I in fact, my problem is with four machines. They get spread all over creation. It's a real nightmare, which is why I've had to go to the backup machine and collect everything. Um, I save all my pictures of JPEG so far because I didn't know the difference between the other sheets. <laughs> about six thousand dollars. But when I go to rotate, I lose. You can, you can get into half my picture. Four, about twelve hundred. I don't know what I'm not doing right, but when I when so I just hit simple rotate, I lose half the picture. It may go away, but it's not it's not lost. It's not there. Are you cropping it somehow? No. What are you rotating? Um. Rotating tool? Yes. In what? <laughs> In what? Photo suite. Okay. What it may be doing is fitting it to the original canvas. No control. Right. I just don't know how to make the canvas. Well, that's change. the problem. Is so you, you've rotated. You've got a fixed size that's set by the canvas, and you flip the picture in there. So well, it I can take whack it off. Do a drag and make the white section bigger. That doesn't but change the size of the canvas. That just makes the white section bigger. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. okay. in, in Photoshop, there's there's a difference between dragging out the canvas and going in and resetting the canvas size. Isn't it also where she's taking a portrait going from landscape to the studio? Yeah. And that's what she's losing then? Yeah, she's losing the, the, the part right. that dropped that off because of the size. Well, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Okay, I don't know you're going printing, but yeah. okay. I probably haven't found it in the other it's, it's a way the program is handling the rotation. I think I would rotate the picture outside of the program before I fed it to it. Yeah. I take IR view, rotate the picture, get an R command, rotate it, save it, and then grab it. Right. Because then it'll come into the then the software package that you're editing will say, oh, the canvas size is this. Okay. That's assuming well, that it'll automatically do canvas it sizes. Do automatic. You don't have a preset canvas size. Yeah. And that's what I'm worried because I'm not sure that it does. Yeah. Photo editing is. Yeah, but it's still a pain in the ass. <laughs> it, it's, it's extremely time consuming. It, it's a good program. I just never have uh, caught on to that. That's all. You know, a lot of this is what you're comfortable using and what you get used to. So, why did I pay school and why don't I just pay you teaching? Because I don't give out degrees. <laughs> but if you really like one, I can take care of it. Yeah. I'm sure it won't take too long. <laughs> yeah, if you like it, it can be from Harvard. Anything. You put a board board on your head. Good. Thanks. That's good. Um, what's